Guys, guys, what is that? Is it getting bigger? Or closer? Congratulations on, on such a fantastic movie. Uh, I want to start at the beginning, actually, with Lorenzo, because you've produced all, I believe, eight Transformers movies at this point. Including this one, yeah. Yes. Whew. At what point were you? did you start thinking about an origin story for these iconic characters, and, and did you know from the start that it would be animated? Every time we thought about what was the next movie, this story kept coming up because it has such a powerful emotional pull. We kept saying, well, there's really no way to do this live action, and that's what we were doing, so we kept going. But e literally each time it would come back up. You know, part of, I think, in a way, the obligation you have for this avid a fan base is to keep trying to give them new experience. And this was a way to provide them a whole new experience. I mean, I guess you could do it live action, but it'd probably be $500 million, you know. Animation allows you to expand the palette. You know, there's almost nothing that is not possible. So that was really exciting to not have to think about limitations in that respect other than length and money. I mean, having seen the Transformers movies, I, I, the word limitations doesn't come to mind because you guys do incredible <laughs> things in that. So was it sort of exciting? Were there immediately things you knew you wanted to do? Josh and I would talk a lot about, we talked a lot about the film through COVID. That's, we were sitting on Zoom for many, many, many hours. And the thing that really came through was this idea that we wanted to have the audience feel as bad for Megatron as Optimus. And that moment of friendship lost uh, that would have a resonance to the audience. And it's not something that, I mean, it's a pretty high bar to try to get to in, in the sense of like, well, he's the bad guy. You're not supposed to like him, you know? And one of the interesting things that Josh reminded me of yesterday was that at one point, the audience was siding a little too much with Megatron. <laughs> and we were like, well, wait a second. Um, we want it to be equal, but not in favor of our, our eventual villain. So, you know, that was something that I felt was a really high bar to get to and, and exciting that it, if we felt like we got there. And Josh, what is your history with the Transformers? Did, did you grow up with the toys? And, and what was sort of your first reaction when you were approached about this? Oh, yeah, I grew up, I, have, I still have my toys. I do and, too. Um, <laughs> uh, I watched the cartoon in the 80s growing up. And, and like Saturday mornings, I just loved Saturday morning cartoons. And that's what got me into animation in the first place. So in a weird way, it's just kind of coming full circle. You know, I, I read the script. and I was, But at first I was thinking, you know, another Transformers movie, there's been so many, like what's new about this? And I love that it was about this relationship, yeah. about these two characters that we know and, and love as antagonists, but what's the story before that? And then what Lorenzo was saying, I love the idea of going, okay, no villain uh, is the villain of their own story, right? And so how can we make Megatron, how can we understand him more than ever? Mm. The thing that took the longest was making their relationship work at the beginning of the movie, because knowing that they were going to break up at the end, if we made that work at the beginning, it would make it really tragic. Yeah. The key was Sentinel Prime and his love for Sentinel Prime. The more that we made him obsess over like his hero and then have his hero backstab him, that really helped turn that key. We had to fight our knowledge of who Optimus and Megatron were. Yeah. And it was interesting because we would write scenes and those characters kept infiltrating the Orion Pax D-16 situation. We were like, no, 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 he's not Optimus yet. He wouldn't say that. I've never encountered that. And that was a really interesting challenge because you had to really, especially somebody who had gone through eight, eight, eight movies, you really believed you knew it. And the surprise for me is now I know them much better. Wow. Jason, to that end, your, your team had this unique challenge in designing the film and the, and the look of the Transformers. How much did the previous films influence your style? Because there is so much history to draw on. Just like the, the story point of view, uh, we had uh, a, a huge shotgun blast of visuals to sort of sift through and find gold. And having those early conversations with our production team and with Josh and really figuring out what the voices for the movie was instrumental. And Josh and I have a very similar aesthetic and respect for Generation 1 Transformers. And looking at Floro Derry's designs and what he had done on the 1984 series as well as the movie was pretty instrumental. And actually looking at the toys too, like looking at the Masterpiece Edition toys and seeing the simplified faceplates and, and being able to see the, the emotion come through on the characters was 
absolutely essential. One, making sure that the dialogue, when these like really serious moments were happening, were being translated across. And I really like the idea of them kind of earning their faceplates as they get older through the film too. So when they first start off, they're minors, simplified polymorphic faceplates, and by the end of the movie, they kind of have more cut lines on them. So they're sort of aging in the movie, which is kind of unique as they become transformers. That's so, you. You put it in a much more eloquent way than I did. I was like, they they evolve and they sort of seem. The word I came up with was rounder, before they become more angular, um, the ones that we're familiar with today. But it, it's it's kind of cool because they're not actually transformers at the start. They have that's to right. Yeah. So them. they're they don't have their transformation cogs yet, and Alpha Trion, as you saw in the cave, gave them the ability to transform, and it changes their entire world. So we wanted them to look like shiny new cars. That was, I asked Josh, I said, well, you know, what are you thinking about for their paint and their surfacing detail? And thankfully we had ILM to help us with that in the look dev side. And so we went through a lot of different iterations, starting off with like scratches and scuffs and really unique material properties. And then once they get their transformation cards, we played around with this idea called line decker, which is like these vertical lines and also metallics. So these surfacings had these interplays inside the environment and we wanted to make sure that they always read against their background. So their iconic colors against a neutral background would always make them step forward. And so we always played to the saturation of the environment as we designed the characters and the environments. Lynn, editing is such a fascinating process, particularly for animation where I imagine you, know, you must collaborate so closely with all the creative staff. Um, what is the process like? Are you working off storyboards? Do you have finished scenes? Where does it begin? Well, an animation begins uh, with the script, and then the whole script or scene by scene is launched to the board artist with Josh um, to draw in boards what the script says, you know, um, creating the environment and everything and where they are in the story. So basically, I get storyboards. We record s temporary dialogue, and then I have to add all the sound effects just to, is it a fast action scene? Do I need more heavy sound effects? Is it day or night? You know, all the sound effects to sell it. And then we add temporary music as well. Is it an action scene or a comedy scene or an emotion scene? Just to sell what the script is supposed to represent in a visual form. So basically, we'll put up the entire script in a storyboard form with all the elements I just described just to see if it's working and if, what the pace is like. And if it's too long, is it too short? Are we following the arc of the characters? So it's kind of the keeper of the story in editorial. And we kind of do this for three years. Because, you know, it may be like, oh, the, the second act's playing really well, but we got to work on the opening. Um, so we'll go back, adjust what makes sense, and then relaunch those into storyboards, implement that in, and then just kind of keep going from there until the, the film is feeling right. And at the same time you're doing this, you also have to start going, oh, well, we have a deadline, and we have to start <laughs> getting things put into the camera department, which is taking those boards and putting them into a 3D world. And sometimes you're limited, too, because they'll be like, wait, they're Transformers. They don't fit in that room anymore because... It's, it's a bigger room that our, our art department's designed. And so it kind of can change the scene even, a little emotion. So it evolves over time. When you record your actors too, they come up with improvisations that just are gold. And then we're like, oh, wait, now we've got to add this element to that scene because it's incredible and put it in. And then you start taking it all the way through animation and everything once you get it. But it, it's kind of you're jumping around the story a while for three years. And then part of my job, too, is like if something was really funny, like last year and everybody loved it, eight months can go by and yeah. then you're just still clinging to that going, I know you all saw that for the last two years, but it's still funny. So, <laughs> so I'm just kind of like trying to hold on to stuff if, if it's worthy and it's holding the integrity of the film and the storytelling. So that's what happens. <laughs> you know, we'll have uh, the layout department, the cinematographer, Chris Batty, come in and he go, hey, I have an idea to change this shot. And so this is one of the benefits of animation. You can, yeah. Yeah, as long as you have the money and time, you can keep changing things. I was going to say one thing that we had different in this movie than other movies I worked on is we had a virtual art department where a lot of the models were built in the art department in 3D. And so Chris Batty, our cinematographer, and I had conversations every day about the scale of the characters to the environments and then the way that the actual animation would take place in art. And so we can do a lot more like look dev and animation de development in the art department as it goes over to layout, which was pretty instrumental in moving the story forward and faster. 
Yeah, absolutely. And when when it's in boards, the board artists aren't really, they're not aware of necessarily the environment yeah. that they're building. So that's why it is part of the evolution. The challenge of story. any action scene is, what are you doing that's fresh? You know, as you pointed out, eight movies in, like, okay, what haven't we seen in terms of how a Transformer could fight? So, you know, one of the things that we had a lot of fun with was like, well, what about their legs can go in a certain direction that we've never seen? Or... Can we do add a little sort of kung fu aspect to it? There's so many different parts that go into making an action scene work, you know, that are also conceptual, not just how do you put it together. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, how do you stage that last fight between the two now mortal enemies? Yeah. You know, what's the right version of that? You mentioned at one point that, that maybe D16 was a little too sympathetic. Mm -hmm. um, and I would credit a lot of that to the fact that you have this amazing voice cast, uh, including mm -hmm. Brian Tyree Henry and obviously Chris Hemsworth. Um, the cast brings so much to it. Um, Everything, yeah. And you're probably working with them over a period of years. If you say it's, I, I don't know if they're recording the temp dialogue, probably not. It starts at the temp, but okay. once you do push things through and you record that cast, yeah, Gene. you are you are looking for their best acting, and you will find new things that they're bringing to the recording, especially if they're able to improvise something in. And we're like, we love that. How do we put that into our movie? Because that's a nice twist that they just added. And then you know we make it work. Yeah, I mean, everybody, all of them were improvising. They were they have in a great way. Like they knew what the scene was about, but then they would take it even further. Well, again, it's such a spectacular movie. The good news is it's going to be out in theaters at the end of this month, so you can see it again and again. Again, I want to thank you so much for being here, and thank you for being a great audience. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thank you.